Hello, everyone. I see some people coming in, our early arrivals. I'm going to give it another minute, and then we will get started. But welcome. All right, we are at the top of the hour, so why don't we get started here? Welcome, welcome. Um, good afternoon, morning, evening, wherever you happen to be. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Nina Chung, and I'm joined by my colleague, Tiara Broom, who is doing her operations magic behind the scenes here. This is the Rockefeller Foundation's Communications Community of Practice, for which Hathaway has served as Secretariat for over a year now. It grew out of the Foundation's State and Territory Alliance for Testing, or STAT, a network organized to share best practices around testing, K-12 school reopening, and vaccination. We at Hathaway Communications worked with the Foundation to develop this group to bring that same spirit of collaboration and peer learning to the critical subject of strategic, effective, and persuasive communications in the national COVID-19 response. And we have learned so much with you all from the speakers and experts who've joined us to share their expertise through these difficult couple years. One important update we have to share today, especially, is that our colleagues at Brown University School of Public Health will be taking on the management of the community of practice starting next month, which means the community will benefit from the additional resources of the STAT network that Brown is also leading. Um, of course, the point of this group will be geared as it's always been, um, towards strategic communications based on real practice and research. And our colleague Claire Wardle at Brown will be joining us shortly after the Q&A part of this session to introduce herself and share more details. So the one thing that we do encourage you to do if you're here while we have you is to resubscribe to Brown's email list um, as we're not simply just handing over, um, we have quite a few emails on the list. We're not just uh, handing it over. So we really encourage you to just uh, sign up quickly. I think that should show up in chat shortly. Thanks, Tiara. And we'll also share that link out in our upcoming emails, including the recap email that comes after the session. So you can share that widely with your colleagues. Last few notes here before we get started. Um, we love to know who you are, where you're coming from in the country world. So if you're comfortable, please share your name city organization into the chat box and any questions that come up during the discussion, we welcome that. So you can drop that into chat or the Q&A box and we'll hopefully get to as much of that as possible in the last quarter of the hour. So finally, I am proud to introduce my colleague, Jim Luke Kameyer, our senior counsel for media at Hathaway Communications. He'll be moderating our discussion today about how the worlds of journalism and public health communications can partner in a way that truly supports communities needs. So, Jim, on to you. You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. What a great, what an auspicious start. I'm really excited to hear from our guests today, so I want to go ahead and get started. Uh, first, uh, Gabriella Emanuel is a senior health and science reporter for WBUR, Boston's NPR station, and she's been covering COVID basically nonstop since she joined WBUR in 2021. Uh, she also has spent five years as a reporter at GBH, and Gabrielle's, Gabriella's stories regularly appear on NPR's Morning Edition and All Things Considered, and she's reported epi episodes for Planet Money and for Code Switch. Her work has appeared in the New York Times and in the Atlantic. We're really, we're really appreciative of her time. I've also got Nikki Willander, as she's a senior media specialist at Jefferson County Public Health in Lakewood, Colorado. Before managing the media relations for Jefferson County Public Health, Nikki was a health reporter herself. So she's used that experience to help guide her work with the health media in Colorado and beyond. And I, we also have Stacey DiLorenzo. She is the Interim Vice President of Communications and Marketing at the George Washington University. Stacey has more than 30 years of executive level communications, marketing and media relations experience. And she was recently promoted to the, her position after serving as the Executive Dean of External Relations 
at the School of Public Health there. Before GW, Stacy was a senior director of marketing and communications at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. And prior to joining the field of public health, she spent 20 years in the media business too. So she has had executive positions at Maryland Public Television and Discovery Communications. So we've got an auspicious panelists here to join us. And I'm really excited to, to talk to them. And I wanna ask all three of you to give any additional information about yourselves and in your background, especially as it relates to the general theme that we're talking about today, best practices for working with reporters, especially in public health. I'll start with Stacy and then Nikki, and then we'll let uh, Gabriella speak to what has been most helpful to her as a reporter. Stacy. Sure. Well, thank you so much and welcome everyone. It's very exciting to be here. I see people from around the country putting their name in the chat. That's fantastic. Um, so I guess to sh just share best practice from my perspective along the way is to always remember to hire well. I had the uh, uh, privilege of when I got to George Washington of helping to set up the communications function for the School of Public Health there. So it was the first department of communications that the public health school ever had. And I really, I mean, writing press releases, I've managed people who did it, but I wasn't really on the front line. So I looked around uh, far and wide and I found a really great former science reporter for US News, uh, for, for USA Today rather. And she she's still at GW, we still work together. And what has worked so well with our partnership is we work on the strategy together and it's not just writing press releases, as you know, it's a lot more than that these days in terms of uh, promotion, building relationships with the media, working with the journals to make sure we can agree on an embargo uh, publication date. And she is so expert at translating some of the more complex science into really readable stories, has great ideas for social media campaigns and it's a omni-channel approach that we take. And I think that has really, really helped us to get our messages out there and working with the different faculty across the school with this approach has, has led us to be very successful in terms of getting a lot, a lot of media coverage over the years. That's great. And I'll move on to Nikki. Yes, hi, thanks for having us all on here today. Super excited to talk about this topic. Um, my background, I got my degree in journalism and I worked in local newspapers and then now I've transitioned into being kind of on that other side of the communications coin and doing media relations for a local public health department. So I, I think that my biggest, my biggest best practice is to build relationships, to really treat whether you are a reporter and you're you're working with um, PIOs or vice versa, to really treat these people as partners and your team rather than adversaries, because I know so frequently we get messaging that oh I don't want to be on the news or all these different things, but it is really a great um, great symbiotic relationship that can happen when when you work together. Um, and having been on the local side in both, um, I have the most immense respect for local reporters and. I'm so thankful for the opportunity I get to help them do their jobs well, especially in an ever-changing media landscape. That's great. Um, I'll ask Gabrielle the same question. Sure. So for me, um, I think what got me into um, journalism and what kind of keeps me going is the overarching goal of kind of making complex things and taking them, making them clear and compelling. And I think when my goal is to do that and what I am looking for in a source or somebody who will be part of my story is when they can do that, when they can take these complex nuanced things and make them really clear and um, compelling for somebody who wouldn't otherwise care. And there are a couple of things that go into that, I would say. And for me, there are three kind of big things. The first I would say is know what medium you're working with. So I'm a radio reporter and working with radio and trying to get uh, cuts of tape sound for radio is totally different than what you need if you're going for uh, print or TV. So thinking in terms of, I'm happy to talk about what we are looking for in radio, but for example, if you take a radio story on this exact same topic as a print story on the same topic, the radio story is always shorter. It probably has a whole lot less statistics, a lot less numbers. Um, 
so knowing that going into it is really helpful. It's also radio's passive. Like somebody's usually doing something else when you're listening to radio. So you need to keep their attention the entire time. Um, it's also conversational, those types of things. So knowing who you're talking to, I think helps in being as clear as you can be. The second thing I would say is that journalists are trained to do a good job at making things clear. What we really need other people to do is to bring the emotion and bring the energy and, and the valence. So when somebody can say, uh, this is so important that it keeps me up at night, I can't say that as a journalist. <laughs> But having somebody else, a source, say that is really valuable, or this is the most important thing that's happened in a century, things like that. I can't say, but if somebody else has the emotion and the authority to say that, that is fantastic. And the last thing is to think and work in sound bites. Um, these are short, they need to be strong, um, and practicing them ahead of time um, and thinking through what goes into a really good sound bite, which we can talk about, is incredibly helpful. So I just am working on a story that's coming out later this week. And I interviewed three different academic experts for it. And two were fantastic and had amazing sound bites. And the last one, I just felt like I was on the phone with her the whole time trying to get a sound bite. And it was so hard. And I almost wanted to be like, can you just say this? But of course, I can't say that. Um, so, so having um, practice and thought through sound bites ahead of time um, is really helpful. So those two two of the things you mentioned um, are kind of related, being clear and compelling and bringing emotion to it. So if you can bring a, emotion to it in a compelling and clear way, combining those two things, so then you've got the key to the realm, so to speak. So if you can summarize what you think you want to tell a reporter in, say, one sentence, right? And then also bring an emotional aspect to it. You had one of those examples there in, your, in the example you gave. I can't remember what you said, but Something that, you know, this keeps me up at night, yeah. right? That's a yeah. easy, short way to say something that also brings a little emotion to it. Exactly. Yeah. So as much, um, I think, especially for the radio, people often connect with other people. So if somebody's saying something matters to them, it's particularly valuable. It keeps me up at night versus like, this is really important. Um, so I think having that personal element is extremely valuable. Yeah, great. That's fantastic. So um, let me ask you all kind of a related question. Um, and uh, I'll start with Stacy um, to give us what's the most important skill for public health communicators today? What would say, say if I have an extra 15 minutes in my day or an extra, maybe an extra hour in my day, hope, you know, knock on wood, that would be a great thing to have. But uh, uh, what skill should I be strengthening? What, what skill pays off the biggest dividends over the long term for someone working in public health communication? Wow, okay, that's a meaty question. Um, and it's a good question because there's, so many, so much, there's only so much time in the day. And from where I sit and where I think from where our media team sits, one of the most effective and beneficial aspects of, of our job is to make sure that our academics are trained up. So we do a lot of media training with them. And in, anyone who works on a campus knows that there's, there's some faculty who love it, who just are naturals, who can do those great sound bites, but most of them can't and most of them are reluctant, but yet they're doing really important research. And because they understand the research, we need them to be the experts talking about it, whether it is radio, television or print. So making sure that your experts and your spokespeople are ready to go at any time, right? Because you never know when the, the media is gonna call. Now, sometimes it's more uh, strategic and we're working with them because we know they have a paper coming out and we're doing an embargoed strategy but mostly we need our go-to people ready to go whenever it's possible. So we spend a lot of time doing what Gabriella was talking about, personalizing the message. For instance, the Dean of the Public Health School uh, is a pediatrician, but she's also a mother. So when she's talking about things like vaccinating children, she can work in, and as a mother, you know, this is how I feel about it. And people connect with that, right? Because that's the way we are, we're humans, we're looking for those connect those connected pieces. So I would say making sure um, it's it's really important that whoever's gonna be out front is really trained up to get the messages out there. 
That's great. Uh, Gabriella? Sure. What's the one skill? <laughs> uh, the one skill, I would probably go back to the sound bites. And I would say, like, practicing them ahead of time, say them in the mirror. Don't read them when you're talking to someone. That sounds awful. But having said them a couple times to yourself, to um, someone else, they flow off the tongue easier. And that matters in radio. The energy you bring to something um, really matters. So you can say something in a really bored tone of voice, and that's fine for print. But for radio, that doesn't work. Um, so having said them and having them flow off your tongue is really important. Um, we talked a bit about like what goes into a soundbite, but I would say I never use a piece of tape that's more than 20, 25 seconds. So and more likely it's 15, 17 seconds, 10 seconds. So getting something really succinct, um, using strong language. So for example, I don't want people to say, I think, I want them to say, here's what we know. I don't want someone to say, we may, I want them to say, we are committed to fill in the blank. So that type of thing. Um, another thing for uh, sound bites, if you're talking about statistics, which is great, make them personal. Um, so instead of saying 170,000 people in DC are functionally illiterate, say next time you get onto the subway, look to your left, look to your right. And one of those people is functionally illiterate, something like that. Um, analogies is really helpful in sound bites. Uh, so I remember a story still that said, it was talking about food waste. And it said like, we waste so much food that you could fill up the Sears Tower every day with our food waste. Things like that, things that are visual. So working, like really perfecting your sound bites and then not ever using cliches or technical language. But if you can use a tweak on a cliche, um, I still remember from years ago hearing someone say to him, um, the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth are three different things. Like that tweak kind of works. So really thinking through and processing what you're gonna say. And if you have your message, um, bringing it into the interview, repeating it again and again is really valuable. And also um, this is slightly different, but remembering that you're in charge, remembering that you are the one like I can ask you any question I want, but you don't have to answer. So remembering that you have your message and you can say what you want and you can pivot to it whenever you want, I think is valuable from um, the other side. And I should just say that a lot of these techniques that are really um, valuable are in a book called um, The Media Training Bible. Somebody gave it to me years ago and every time I talk to people about how to, how to engage with the media. I point them to that book because um, it, it just has things laid out in a really um, clear and easy way and tons of examples. One of the examples I just used is actually from that book. So, And we'll put that into the chat for folks if they um, want to check that out. Uh, you know, another way I just, I've described this is the, you know, the way you describe in a really smart way, trying to be succinct and being able to in a very succinct and smart way, summarize your point is I, it's kind of like the Thanksgiving table response. When someone who knows nothing about what you're doing, you go to Thanksgiving and somebody says, what are you working on right now? Um, that's the person you're talking to. That the person who knows nothing about public health, yeah. they, know that they don't know the difference between public health and health care. They, they, it's just, this person needs to understand, like it's your aunt, maybe it's your grandma, it's, maybe it's your spouse. You know, when you go home at that day, what are you working on? If you can describe that in one succinct sentence, and then also, as you said, Gabriella, add in, you know, a smart, you know, active verbs and, and personalized stats makes it even more, then you've basically got what you need. And if you can't do that, then you need to keep practicing. And that was the way I described it. Yeah. Can, I, can I jump in on this point? Because um, public health, it's really difficult to do that, right? Because public health is population health. It's a lot of statistics. It's a lot of data. It's a lot of evidence. And one of the things I'm always trying to get the, the faculty to understand is that numbers are numbing. I'm always telling them, nobody just wants to hear you spew out numbers. And you got to find the data in the, I mean, the humanity and the data, like what's the emotional connection? You know, think exactly what you just said. If you were talking to your neighbor or your grandmother, how would you get them to 
to want to you know click into to to what the point you're trying to make. So that's particularly challenging in public health because of what you know the type of material that we deal with. But it's really important to do. Absolutely. <clears throat> so let me ask. Uh, I should ask Nikki I, the, your your response on what's your what's your one skill that you would recommend uh, for for people in public health to to work on. Absolutely. Well, I think that, I mean, Gabriella and Stacey, you really both, you both emphasized emotion and the importance of personalizing things. And as a public health communications professional, it's your job to have those relationships, not only with your media partners, but with the people within your organization, so that you know who you can tap to be an expert on different things. And to have that relationship built before you have to ask them to hop on camera and do an interview. So being able to, to know that, oh, I can go to this person because they're an expert on this topic and they're going to be able to, to pull in pieces from their life that make it relatable. So I think really, if you have 15 minutes in your day, use that 15 minutes to talk to your coworkers, use that 15 minutes to talk to the reporters that you work with frequently. I mean, I think that re reporters have one of those those very thankless jobs and very difficult jobs. They're on constant deadlines. Newsrooms are much smaller than they used to be. I've never met a reporter that's just relaxed at work. It's always a very busy, busy environment. So if you can be like, hey, I'm here for you. What can I do for you? And they know that they can rely on you to not make their job any harder. Um, I think that it's really just about building those relationships as well as you possibly can before you need them. Um, especially in situations like we faced the last couple of years in, in the pandemic, if you don't have a relationship with somebody, you're not going to be able to build it in the 15 minutes between when the news breaks and when you need to get it on, um, on, on TV. You know, you, you need to work as hard as you can to build those relationships ahead of time. And the other big, big skill that I would say this is a tough one for me personally um, that I've worked really hard the last few years to, to toughen up with is not being risk averse. Um, in the public health world, we, we are very data driven. We are very, very strategy driven. But sometimes, especially in the field of communications, a little bit of creativity and being not being afraid to throw the pasta at the wall and see if it sticks gets you pretty far. You have to be willing to, to take that chance. As he, he told me not to speak in cliches and here I am, I'm like, throw the pasta. <laughs> <laughs> But um, you just have to be willing to try something new and to not feel like a failure if it fails, because that's that's what we do. We try we try and get large amounts of important information out to as many people as possible. And sometimes sometimes that's not going to go the way we plan it. Um, so just not being risk averse and being willing to to try something new, even if even if you're not sure if you're going to fall on your face. That's that's. That is inspiring advice, uh, you know, to think about, you know, being being ready to have a, being okay with making a mistake. That's that's actually really smart. I, I like the way you, you phrase that. Um, sticking with you, Gabriella, any examples of, uh, or let me, see, let me change, going back to Nikki, I, I mentioned to you uh, before, or I, you mentioned you were a health reporter. So how does that change? How has that changed anything you do with reporters, your work with reporters now? Or is there any examples of, I know there may be so much that you couldn't do it. You could spend an hour just talking about how that's changed the way you do your job. But are there a few examples of how that might affect your work? Absolutely. So when I worked as a reporter, I covered, I worked in a, a small town at a local paper and I covered everything from health to adventure sports to agriculture. Um, and so being able to, to try to see all of those different lenses and how they all really interconnect that, I mean, there's no farmer out there who wants to grow non-nutritious food. And so looking at how the, the aspects of every different every different avenue in life all connect back together. Um, and having that context has been really important for me as a communications person, because I can look and think, okay, well, if I tell, if I want to pitch a story that is strictly about how vaccinations are going to affect five-year-olds in our community, it's got to be more than that. I mean, everybody knows that a five-year-old should get vaccinated. 
you should sit there and have a more robust conversation about, did you know that this is going to improve the way that our daycares and our, our schools are able to function? And really being able to tie things into a larger context, I think is really important. Um, like Gabrielle has said, it's, it's the reporter's job to make things make sense. And the more that you can show those linkages, the better, the better that is. And one of the ways that I have I was very lucky when I was a reporter that I worked with some excellent PIOs. I worked with some people who, who did make my job much easier, who were able to, to show me those linkages so that I was able to tell more people. Um, and I've always prioritized that in my career. I want to be that person for a reporter. Um, so I, I talked about building those relationships ahead of time. Um, in 2018, 2019, I was taking reporters at every, every, outlet in our in our area, whether it was the small mountain papers to the larger TV stations, I was setting up coffee dates and I was saying, hey, let's just go out. I don't have a story to pitch you. I just want to hear what you need from me and what I can give to you. And whether or not that's you need a source and something that I can't provide, okay, let me see what I can get you. Um, or it's you, you are really interested in doing more in-depth reporting on mental health. I'll never forget, I had a really great coffee with, um, with one of our local reporters who she said she was, she was really excited to start doing the more enterprise, in-depth human interest features. And she was like, I want your help in helping me figure out all the different pieces of that. Um, and so I didn't go there to picture that, but we walked out of it with an amazing story. Um, so just taking the time to spend with reporters, um, I don't know that I would have that insight if I hadn't been a reporter and really value the relationships that I had with PIOs ahead of time. So now I feel like I need more than 15 minutes of my day, both I've got to you know, <laughs> learn, from, learn from my coworkers, which is really valuable, but also, you know, spend some time to have, maybe it's during my lunch hour, have that uh, <laughs> conversation with a reporter. Now that's something that, that's a question I'll ask the other two panelists is that um, as a reporter and a former reporter, now person working in comms, um, lunch, lunch with reporters, coffee with reporters in a post COVID world now maybe, but uh, also is a question, but um, is this something you have done or would recommend doing or yes or no? Absolutely. Well, Stacy, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, we. Um, I think it's it's everything Nikki said of, and and Gabriella about building relationships with reporters is key um, because you'll be able to rely on them and they can rely on you um, when they when they need information or need access to an expert um, and that type of thing. We actually just set up a uh, session with our president of the university and the Washington Post and our provost and. They had some questions for him, but there was there was nothing particularly newsworthy. There was no major piece of research or major donation we were announcing. And after the interview was over, the, the president said to me, well, I, I don't know what the story is. And I said, well, that kind of wasn't the point. Um, building the relationship and, and having an in-person meeting with the president of a, of a major university for this uh, education reporter for the post is really important. And those are the types of relationships that we want to build. So um, I couldn't agree more that it's, it's, it's very strategic and it can really pay off. What do you think, Gabriella? I'm, I'm willing and happy and it, want to talk to basically anyone. <laughs> um, I think one of the hardest parts of the job is finding the totally new, totally original story. So the more people I can talk to, the better, and the, the more people who are off the beaten path. So not just the, the kind of the guy who's always um, quoted in the media. And, and often I'll find the stories that, that you didn't know were stories um, side conversations after an interview on a different topic that will end up um, almost always there's like a, a story that comes out of doing another story not on the same topic but because of a conversation before or after the actual interview yeah so i have also um, explained this to uh, or in my description of this with reporters uh, or when i'm pitching this idea with reporters to just go have coffee and say explicitly we do not have a pitch for you we don't have a story for you that's the reason why we're doing this but um, my source works, you work in public health. This person is, you know, an expert in this aspect of public health. And so you're, you may have a story over the next year in which this issue is going to come up. And that's why we'd love to have you connect with this person. And so showing value, anything, anytime I can show value to a reporter um, that adds, sometimes it's great that, you know, there are great 
great, fantastic, curious reporters like you, Gabriella, who just, I want to hear from people, but also if you can also add to that and say, I'm doing, this also is going to have an extra benefit for you because down the road, maybe not today, but there's, there's going to be a benefit down the road for another story down the road. Whether it be sources or perspectives or some extra background you'd be able to give them. Anything else you, uh, other examples of ways in which uh, you might connect with, with a reporter or as a reporter, they connect with you, sources connect with you when you're not pitching them? When they're not pitching you? Um, that's a good question. Uh, often um, there are, I, I've developed like different go-to people who I will just check in with on certain topics. Um, and they're not necessarily like have a professional title that goes along with it, but there are a handful of people who just know a world really well. Um, so for example, this came out a story I just did on um, wheelchairs and how often they break down and how long it takes to repair them. That just came out of a conversation um, that I had because I regularly check in with um, somebody who happens to be a wheelchair user. And she was saying, you know, this is like the thing we talk about um, within our world, but it hasn't really gotten attention um, outside of that world. So there are, um, and I, I, it's, it's almost random how I develop those different people who I'm in touch with, um, but often, it, I will report one story and if they stay in touch or I stay in touch, um, that's how it happens. It's one story that then begets like 10 stories in the next 10 years or whatever it is. Yeah, that's great. What about um, uh, when you're, when you are pitching the media for any of you, for, for this Nikki and Stacy, are there any other tips or techniques that you found to be especially useful? for pitching? Uh, well, from my perspective, um, for pitching, keeping it short and sweet, um, reporters don't have a lot of time to read through very lengthy pitches. So if you're gonna send them an email pitch, then it better be something that they're gonna read and they're gonna read quickly. Um, meeting the, and, and knowing you know, where they are circulating, like what's their medium. And it, uh, I think Gabriella made this point earlier that you, know, you need to make sure that you're crafting your pitch based on what type of medium, medium that they're working in. Um, providing other, other pieces to the story. So if there's a video we've already shot, a quick Q and A with the faculty member, and we're pitching to TV stations, we can say, hey, you know, you don't even have to send a cameraman out. We've got some video we can let you use. Um, if we've got any data visualizations or any graphics that really help explain a complicated story and we're pitching to um, print or, or, or TV, um, that often increases our chances of getting, of getting that a reporter uh, to cover the story. So it's, it's things that, you know, make it more likely and easier for them to pick up the story and always make sure you've already talked to your ex expert and that they are going to be available and not out of the country and not answering their phone, which they like to do. They like to not answer their phone. Um, so we wanna make sure that they are, they are right there for the reporter to talk to and to clarify anything. I would add to that, that having at the top of your note, what is new, I mean, it's in it's in the name, but news like what we need is something that is new or original or hasn't been reported before the the some peg to say this is why we're talking about it. It could be totally enterprising like that wheelchair story um, had a, a bill uh, that was being filed. I mean, it was small like that. We actually just wanted to talk about wheelchairs breaking down and the issues with repairs. But there was a bill that had just been filed and was working its way through the legislature. So that was um, actually really valuable in saying like, this is why we're talking about it now. That is a really good point. And we, we struggle with that a little bit because every piece of research that every facu faculty member does, they think deserves you know, to be pitched. And that's just not the case. So we have to put it through our lens of, oh, and, and you get to know, like this is really, really gonna sell. We have a faculty member that does research uh, and, and did a piece of research that showed that if you do 15 minutes of walking, 15 minutes after you eat, your chances of developing diabetes goes down quite significantly. I don't remember the number. 
that made its way around the world. That got picked up by every publication. It was very easy, easy to understand. It was, it, was a, it was a really great little piece of research. And we knew it was gonna work just because you know, so many people do suffer with diabetes and we, and we knew there would be interest in it. Um, and it was a consumer friendly piece of research. And that's what we're, we are always looking for um, on, on, on the campus. Like the really wonky policy stuff, it's really hard to get um, those faculty to understand that, oh, maybe not so interesting, but to certain publications, yes, like trade pubs and things like that. But um, that, that's a, that point is really well taken. And a, a friendly reminder to drop your questions into the Q&A box. We have some and we're, we're gonna be answering them uh, one by one, but I'm gonna ask a few more questions from our panelists here. We've got some, already got a ton of great advice. Um, let's talk about the flip side of that. Any bad, exa bad examples, especially, especially Gabriella, examples of things that just maybe make you wanna pull your hair out, maybe things that, mistakes that are made that you, that just are an immediate no-go, other than what we, some of the things we've already discussed, you know, making sure you're succinct, get the new part up at the top, very important also always. Anything else there that? Yeah. Um, so for me, the, one of the biggest things is the jargon. Um, so kind of keeping the technical language out and making it, going back to your Thanksgiving example, or I often say, explaining it to a 12-year-old. I have a four-year-old. He's really good at understanding things, but you have to use different language. So using the language that is um, accessible to everyone is really helpful. I cannot tell you the number of emails I get with a headline that I have, to, or like a subject that I have to read multiple times to make sure I got it. Like nobody should have to read something twice or three times or four times to like know what it's about. Um, and then the other thing I would say, um, this is more what to do versus what not to do, but there tend to be three elements I need in every story. And one is um, stories. So if you have people <clears throat> who capture something really well, um, a personal story. So if, even if it's a public health measure, um, I'm trying to think, for example, uh, vaccine, free vaccines for the uninsured is ending. I'm thinking like, I need that person who would have gotten vaccinated, but can't because they're no longer free. So they have no insurance. How do I find that person? So I often need the story that backs up what's happening, the personal impact. I need the statistics and I need um, kind of the, the sound bites, the experts to explain it. So I need numbers, I need statistics or facts, the the kind of the meat of it, and I need this the emotion as we talked about before in the sound bites. So those are the three things. And if somebody has a pitch where they can offer all of those things, that's I mean amazing. So uh, if somebody is saying like, this is the <laughs> this is the meat, and here I have people who personally experience this and can share their stories and they're already up for it. Um, that makes my work so much easier. Um, I will always then do my own work and go talk to other people to vet everything. But if I know there's somebody who, for me, it's hard to find the uninsured person who isn't yet vaccinated, but wants to get vaccinated. If you already have that, that, and I can know that's available, even if I don't use that person, but I might, that will make me more interested. That's great. So packaging it up. Uh, Nikki, you wanted to say something? Yeah, one of the things that I just kind of really, really hammering that, con that concise and clear point, one of the things that my first editor at a newspaper I worked at, if we would send him long-winded emails, he'd respond and say, could this fit in a tweet? And if it's, if we are wandering around, he's not going to even read the email. He'll say, send me the tweet, send me the tweet. And so we had to literally, and this was back when it was 140 characters, not 280 and telling him, this is why this is important. And 140 characters was a challenge, but it teaches you to really think about what you're saying and use the words that are the most appropriate. And really understanding that we are talking about complex things and how do we keep them short, sweet, to the point, and still relatable. Um, one of the things I think is important to consider when pitching too is that public health isn't something that a lot of people are familiar with. When I, even when I was writing health stories every week, I 
never talked to my local health department because I wasn't clear on the, the differentiation between healthcare and public health. Um, so it's our job in the public health field to make sure that when we pitch something, we explain why we're the best source for it. We explain the difference between the population health that we look at and the, the back end healthcare. You know what I mean? So I think that that's something that's really important for us to keep in mind is how we communicate about what we do and why what we do is different than the, the hospital source that maybe this reporter has been using for years. That's great. What, one more question, and then we'll turn to our um, audience questions, which are coming in. Thank you. Keep, keep asking questions. We'll, we'll organize them for, for our panelists to be able to answer. Uh, I wanted to ask about the moment we are experiencing right now in this pandemic for public health uh, communications professionals. Um, how do you keep reporters' interest in public health you know, during this time whenever Thankfully, we have lower COVID numbers, and you might have an expectation that reporters might, ha might have an interest in covering other stories. They've got a ton of other kind of stories that have been backlogged that are probably they've been wanting to cover that haven't been able to because they're covering so much COVID stuff. Um, and then also, you know, publications and editors getting a little bit of COVID story fatigue, wanting to move on to other storylines. How do you keep your story uh, prominent in that in that environment? I love this question because I think that it's a little bit of A and a little bit of B. It's if a reporter is saying, hey, I really, we've got too much COVID coverage. We need a minute. Okay, well, there's a million other things that public health does that we should still be spotlighting that's still important, that may be more important now than ever um, to be like, hey, okay, great. We're not going to talk specifically about case rates or about, about the latest therapies. Okay, but let's talk about the way that our, our food policy programs have really stepped up to the plate to make sure that people in our community have access to, to healthy and safe and affordable food. Um, it, I think that one of the most important things that we can do to help fight COVID fatigue is understand it. Understand that reporters have it, that our community has it, and that we have it. So what is the way that we want to hear about the updates in COVID as public health professionals? Is it that we want to hear the exact same five data points we've been tracking this whole time? Maybe we might want to see where we've gone on that line, but we also want it couched in the success stories. We want it couched in what has changed, what is different now. Um, so using that when you pitch, saying, we know that COVID rates are lower, here's why that's important, and here's what the actual practical effect that has on our community is. Um, I think that's one of the best tools that we have to continuing to make sure that people are understanding where we are in the pandemic. I, I would um, answer that two ways. So during the pandemic, it was really important for us to be able to pivot really quickly because you know some weeks the focus was on vaccination, other weeks maybe it was masks were coming up. And so we were very cognizant of that and we're pitching and, and changing gears as much as we could. And we had very a lot of success with, with vaccines and we pitched CNN when the vaccines were delivered to our hospital and we offered them an exclusive to come. They filmed the boxes arriving, uh, our healthcare workers on the front line getting vaccinated. And that was very successful for us. But And, and so we sort of did that throughout the pandemic, making sure that we were offering unique and slightly you know, different um, aspects of the story. And to your point about other stories, you know, part of the challenge certainly for us was that there was a lot of other research going on at a university, you know, not just um, COVID. So we tried to keep our ear like every good media team does, you know, what else is going on in the world? And I think it was last summer here in, on, the, on the East Coast when the cicadas, was it last summer or the summer before? I can't remember, right? The cicadas, everybody was like, ah, oh, this invasion of the cicadas. Well, we had a biology expert um, in, uh, who knew that they were experts on cicadas? But um, so we pitched that to a local TV station, and it was great. They they loved it. We we went out into the field, and you know she was holding the cicada and talking about how cool they are, and and um, that got that got a lot of pickup around here because it was one of those stories that you just you know people were fascinated with. We had another story with a faculty member who researches uh, chemicals in fast food, phthalates they're called in fast food, and. And we pitched that out during the pandemic. And again, because people are interested in food and 
um, that got amazing pickup. So looking for the opportunities where, where we think we can get attention other than sort of the story of the day is important as well. That's great. So Stacy used Nikki's advice to, to know everything about your coworkers so that even if they are experts in cicadas, then they, you can you find another story hook for them. That's great. Good job. Um, so let's move on to our uh, questions. We have one question. It's an anonymous question from our uh, from our audience. Any advice for helping public health departments combat misinformation? This is something that we've done whole separate uh, panels on this. But uh, what about in the social social media realm? I think this is where most misinformation spreads. And then a related question: There's been no lack of an incredible controversy over the last couple of years. What are some ways you think about preparing content or topics that you know could be divisive in your communities? I can tackle this one first. I think what we've we've struggled in the last year with our social media going from being a very supportive place that the people were getting necessary important public health information. So we have a lot of people that are just there to spread misinformation and to to try and discount what public health does. Um, and that does provide challenges. But I think that when we then look at our policies around responses, we respond one time in the comments and we respond with what the actual facts are. We never restate. I am so sorry. My dog just had a little, you heard that little scuffle in the background. <laughs> um, we, we never restate the misinformation. We don't restate the myth. We just say, this is what it is. Um, and we don't need to have a back and forth conversation with every person that wants to say something incorrect. Um, I think that really just staying strong in our messaging, saying one time, this is what it is. Um, we've actually had a lot of people start responding really positively and more people starting to say, yes, exactly. This is the facts. Um, so I think that that's one of the important things is just understanding that we are in divisive times and people are going to, people are going to say what they want to say and social media emboldens people to say things they would never say in real life and sticking to those, those talking points and those true facts that we as public health professionals rely on um, is really the best way to handle it and to try and try and make sure that we we change the hearts and minds of the people we can and those that we can't we unfortunately can't good advice i think with social media like you're correct that's where so much of it gets gets um amplified uh, ignoring it uh, is is a strategy that we take because you know we don't want to engage, um, but also there's this phenomena of social media shaming, social media shaming, where the community kind of does what uh, Nikki was just saying, like fights the misinformation that's been put out there. Um, we've seen that on some of our channels um, and in some of the social media. But the other thing we do as a university is we have um, we, for instance, during the pandemic we had a podcast that we called Healthy You. And before the pandemic, it was focused on mostly student life and what they were doing um, in terms of food and mental health and topics like that. We changed it to Healthy You Surviving a Pandemic during the pandemic. And we had, um, we asked Frank Sesno, who was a former CNN reporter who's um, currently at, at GW to be the host. And we turned it into a, um, a, a uh, uh, excuse me, a podcast that focused on helping against the misinformation that that was out there around COVID. And we, we interview not just GW experts, but experts from around the country. So I think fighting fire with fire is one way that we sort of um, um, strategy that we used is to just keep putting the correct information out there You know, you can't argue with science, the science changes the science around COVID at the beginning was changing a lot. And there's a lot that we didn't know, but to be out there with the science as much as we possibly can to combat that is what we try to do. Okay, we have a um, Christine Billings on, as one of our folks who is, is listening in has raised her hand and we have the capacity to unmute you, Christine. So we're gonna try to do that and, and let you ask your question. Hi, I think you can hear me now. Yes. 
Perfect. Thank you. So I actually know Nikki well. I worked with her at the local public health level. I was the incident commander at the local public health level. Um, and I, I just wanted to reiterate, and I think Nikki is spot on with the social media response that responding without uh, reiterating the um, misinformation. Um, and I think we've also done a really good job and Nikki, maybe you can speak to sort of the um, involving the, the community and the research piece uh, and what we did with the youth engagement. I think that part was really important as well to gain the trust of the community. Absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up, Christine. It's um, when the availability of the vaccine was extended to include um, include the younger population, that 16 to 29, um, we knew that there was from research that we did through a literature review and then some initial um, just kind of putting some feelings out with the folks that we work with. We knew that there was an attitude in that age group of waiting and seeing how the vaccine works, waiting and seeing how it will affect me. So we decided to launch a full research campaign um, where we did a large scale survey with over 5,000 responses. We did key informant interviews with some of the some of the high school students that we work with um, and really asked what are the barriers to you for getting the vaccine? What are your attitudes around this? What are what are the benefits that you see for getting the vaccine? And then we created an entire communications campaign strictly around what they said. Um, I think that obviously I think that's the best practice when you're creating campaigns is to really use your your intended audience to inform what you do. But that was difficult to during do during COVID because of the just rapid fire way that it all went for all of us. But using that opportunity to engage with a population that we knew was going to be a little more vaccine hesitant helped us make a campaign that when we did post surveying and kind of crunching the data after to see how it all went, we were able to say, see that that campaign actually affected attitudes and got young people vaccinated. So really taking the, that time to understand the motivations and barriers of our community and then create messaging that caters to that and actually meets people where they are was a really effective strategy for us. That's great. It sounds like that was really useful. And I have, we only have like one more minute. So uh, we're gonna hear from Claire Wardle at um, Brown to talk about how they're gonna uh, transition this, this series of, of conversations. But I wanna just do one, uh, maybe one line or one, the last word from each of you on um, any last words you wanna tell this community. I'll start with Gabriella. Uh, last words, I think, um, I would say that, one of the key things is bringing the energy into the interview. If you are passionate about it, that translates and you can hear um, the enthusiasm in the quotes, in the tape, whatever it is. If you've done your prep work and then have the energy and um, excitement, that will go a long way. If you, if you don't have the energy, why should the reporter, right? So <laughs> very good. All right, Stacy, what about you? Yeah, I think I would just reiterate my point earlier of just pivot, pivoting to the moment, like, like make sure you are so aware and you've been paying attention and you, you have a, a sense of what uh, is going on in the media and just pivoting to the moment and, and doing what you need to do, get the right information out there at the right time, get the right expert out there at the right time. Um, it requires, you know, sort of sometimes just throwing everything out that you were working on to be able to do that, right? Because... We all have our day jobs, but I think it's really important um, when we're looking to get our messages out there to the public. Keep it super fresh, just in time delivery of that news. That's great. All right, what about you, Nikki? I think I'm going to go back to my point about relationships. You need you need to have robust and really well developed relationships before you need them. Um, of course, that's easier said than done, and it doesn't mean that you can't build a relationship on the fly and work really well with somebody that you've never spoken to before. But if you can have a conscientious effort to meet the people that you want to be your your partners in the media and to understand your own staff better, you're going to be more successful in your media strategy. Excellent. All right, sadly, we're just we're now just about out of time. But Nikki, Stacy, Gabriella, thank you all so much for for joining us. And thanks to thanks for your everybody who asked great questions and everybody who participated 
um, on this call. Uh, and as Nina mentioned at the top, the management of the communications community of practice is transitioning over to our friends at Brown University. And we'll have we now have Claire, she's here, hello, uh, to share more details on, on that to help wrap, wrap us up. Take it away. Thank you so much. And thanks, what a great conversation this was. Uh, I think I did a webinar about a year ago, I think on the topic of misinformation. Uh, and it's it's great to see this community is carrying on having such thoughtful conversations about so many elements. So very quickly, because I know everybody's got to go, but um, we are starting a new, shh, don't tell the reporters on the call, a new lab called the Information Futures Lab at Brown University. Uh, we've been involved in the Equity First Vaccine Initiative, and we thought this is such a great community, we would love to carry on rather than it just kind of, you know, filter out. So we at the lab want to bring research and practice together. I'm somebody who thinks it's great research, but it's sometimes not connected to what's happening on the ground. And I love the throwing the lasagna at the wall or whatever it was. Uh, there's a lot of that happening, but we're not necessarily evaluating what pasta is sticking and what isn't. So uh, that's the purpose of the lab. And we know that this network is an amazing network. However, I'm European, we think about data very seriously. We can't just steal Hathaway Communications listserv. We need you to opt in. So anybody who's here, if you do it now, you'll do it. If I send you an email, you won't do it. So if you click on the link, it's got like three cells, just put it in and it means that we can then carry on engaging with you, doing really great webinars, carrying on these conversations. Uh, but you have to do that. Otherwise, unfortunately, we won't be able to communicate with you. Um, it's a bad thing to do. So anyway, very quickly, we'd love to continue the conversations going. So please click on that link, which is in the chat box. That's it. Okay, thank you, Claire. And thank you all for joining us today. Really appreciate your time. Thank you, it was wonderful.